everybody, and thank you so much for coming <coughs> to the first of Expression FM and XTV's 2024 Guild Election Roundtable Discussions. I'm aware it's quite a long name. So, my name is Florence, and also here at the back we have Tom, and we are your Heads of News at Expression. Now, this is an event solely organised by students for students to try and help people make informed choices about who they want to represent them at the Guild and the Athletics Union in the next academic year. I also want to thank and welcome anyone who is joining us on Catch Up, whether that be on Expression FM or on XTV. Thank you for tuning in. So this is an event with two halves. The first is tonight and then the second is tomorrow night, right here again in the Expo Lab, same time, same place, and we'd love you to join us then as well. So today we are covering the roles of Communities and Equality Officer, Societies and Employability Officer and Sports President in that order. Each discussion will have a moderator who will guide the conversation with some key questions and talking points and then may also take some questions from the audience. The aim of this is to prompt a fruitful conversation about the key issues and challenges that students face, key issues that are to do with that role, the one that we're currently discussing, as well as commentary on what could be done and maybe passing some judgments on what has been done in the past. We've asked all our candidates to follow the Guild's campaigning rules, which means the candidates are not allowed to make manifesto pledges or promises and then they cannot engage in negative campaigning. When they talk to other candidates, they must not attack them or their ideas personally and must use polite language. And then rather than bringing others down, we ask candidates to sell themselves and their beliefs. So, without further ado, we shall get into the first discussion. So, as I just said, I'm Florence, and I will be moderating this discussion for the role of Communities and Equality Officer, for which I am joined by four out of the five candidates. I'll start by giving them each 30 seconds to introduce themselves. After this, I will begin prompting the discussion with some questions, topics, basically anything that's aligned with this role. And it's important to give everyone a fair chance to speak, so I'll be asking candidates to politely finish their statements promptly so we can hear what others have to say. And I'd encourage candidates to bounce off each other's ideas, be inspired what other people say, and then basically just have a nice conversation about the role and what it may entail. We'll also be taking some questions from the audience if there are any, and then we'll give candidates a chance to speak about those too. We imagine that this conversation will last for no longer than 30 minutes, but we've allocated that time in case you just all have so much to say about that. So first of all, we will start with introductions. We will start this way and then work our way along if that's okay. So take it away. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Annie Ransom. I am a postgraduate student studying social research. Um, I am from Orlando, Florida, and I'm also a mature student. Hi, I'm Zixian Komi Jin. I'm from Asia, and as you say, I'm an international student. Um, and uh, I run for equality and community officer. Um, I used to organize the, the Indian color of LGBTQ+. And I also used to work uh, as a Korea developer student union in my home country. And that's me. Thank you. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Thomas. Uh, today I'm running for Communities and Equality. Um, yeah, I'm running on a platform of radical allyship and of uh, doing practical things to make things, uh, to make our guild and um, extra better. So, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Walid and I'm from Sheffield. I'm also running for Community and Equality Officer. And my platform is Healing the World, and we can start by healing the University of Exeter, I guess. Fun fact about me is I once read over 100 comic book issues in a single day. That is quite impressive, and yet thank you so much for joining us today. So my first question is sort of a bit of a look at the past in terms of what the Guild has done in the area of communities and equality before. So when campaigning, it's common to mention new ideas and new possibilities. But I was wondering if there are any events, campaigns or projects that the Guild has run in the past that you believe were particularly successful and that you think might be a good idea to see them again. Does anybody have any opinions on that would like to start? Thomas. Um, I think the two things, I mean, the Guild has done, <coughs> sorry, uh, the Guild has done uh, quite a bit, but I think the two things that spring to mind right away um, 
are two practical things that have helped students. So I think um, the code wasn't officially um, involved with it, but last year with the two pound deal, I think like I think everyone, um, even if they weren't following the guild news, like learned about the two pound meal, and it it was something that's practical that actually helped them in their everyday. And then um, also this year, uh, the gender expression fund, I think that um, was really just a, a great example of the guild, um, like living up to its ideals. It's it's not enough just to say you support a community, but to actually um, help balance out the inequities that they face. Um, yeah, I just respect that a lot. Um, I think uh, Guild holds some board game. The first time I went to this university and I joined Guild because of board game. And I think it's a really good opportunity for the students to from different culture, different background students to know each other. Um, to overcome the uh, different culture gap, and if I, I think if I got this uh, position, I will also hold a board game to build a bridge to reduce, to embarrass diversity and reduce the bias of culture difference. Thank you, Willie. Did you want to speak? Oh uh, well, this is a more. It's working. It's working. Okay, so. So uh, this is a more procedural thing, but the fact that they've got this EDI advisory board and they actively have student of color consultants on it and disabled students on it is one of the things I think is really good because as long as you're as long as you've got inclusivity in every step of your process, the initiatives you make will actually end up being better. Um, I definitely agree with all the points that. Um everyone said, um, especially the two pound meal deal, as well as the gender expression fund. Um, I also think the, um, the fund that you can apply for to have money to be able to join societies and participate in society events is really great. Um, because I think, you know, the cost of living crisis is something that impacts so many people and it really compiles on top of so many other areas of inequality. Um, so I think anywhere where you can help fund students and their ability to enjoy university is really great. Thank you for that. Now, accessibility is an issue raised by multiple of your campaigns. Are there any specific issues with accessibility that you'd like to raise and any possible suggestions of what might be effective to deal with them? Any first and on this. Um, so I definitely have some mobility challenges myself. Um, and I think that the campus can be really intimidating and difficult to navigate um, when finding ways to get around that are going to actively like hurt your body if you already have trouble moving. Um, so I think that is something that could definitely be improved on. I think increasing the availability of places to you know, sit down comfortably is also a huge issue. Um, you know, there's a lot of classrooms that are very cramped and hard to move around in. Um, so I think, you know, more space and more seating and, you know, better <laughs> ways to navigate campus. Thank you. But yeah, definitely um, I agree with everything you said. And just to build off of what you said, I think uh, about navigating around campus, I think definitely, because um, on my campaign page, I talk about how um, uh, accessibility um, uh, guides around campus aren't very good. Um, if you ever actually looked at them, it's just like a list of text instructions without a map, without any um, way to actually navigate. And you feel like you're, um, like, you know, you have to chart a course yourself. Um, so I think the university has a lot more to do with that, but also with accessibility in the sense of um, module content, I think, um, because having take, taken some modules that show like films and whatnot, um, the, uh, lectures like it's kind of on and off. If they give warnings about like flashing lights or um, distressing material or uh, anything of that matter, so I think yeah, those are two things. And uh, I just wanted to add on to what you both said. It does in the classrooms at least. One of the things that I've noticed, like since coming here, is the harsh light up for the classrooms in general. And one that actually speaks to mind is probably the auditorium for the alumni. When you walk into it, it is very harsh lighting. And let's let's say that you're on a degree that has more people on it, right? If you're a person that gets anxious in those sorts of situations, 
you might be dissuaded from even going to your lectures or seminars just because you're terrified of the fact that there are so many people there. Yeah, also a lot, I agree with uh, people's opinions and also uh, I notice that uh, people around me, they serving and uh, the challenge of mental health and I think uh, guild should hold more uh, activities about mental health to support a student uh, and if I can do, I will hold more uh, <coughs> psychology, invite more psychology students to uh, hold a salon to support, to teach people some psychology method to treat their therapist, their mental health as better. Thank you. So the Guild runs many different campaigns throughout the year, some example being Disability History Month, Black History Month, LGBT History Month, those kind of things. Are there any that you've been keen to work on, maybe ones that might not have been covered before, and how could you work with other officers in the Guild to run these events? Well, I think one that speaks to mind for me is Autism Awareness Month. This is it's not something that's really cared about at university, but I think that if I got the role, I'd actually try to get like autism writers to come here and have, have little talks in the halls about the situation for autism and just help raise awareness for disabled students in general. Um, uh, if I, I used to work in the student union, so I have experience of uh, uh, co uh, collaborate with different uh, charitable people. So um, I maybe as a psychology student, I know how to uh, collaborate with different uh, different charitable people, and um, I respect different opinions. That's maybe diversity, and also as an uh, uh, international student, I come to another countries. I have my own background and I know the difference. I am more open-minded to embarrass the difference and diversity. So I think I can, could collaborate with the other um, I think when we talk about these events, about um, uh, different history months, I think they're very <coughs> important and uh, awareness is very important. But I think, um, I don't think we should limit ourselves to just um, raising awareness in these months in particular. Um, I think uh, if the guild, because the guild already has um, resources uh, about how to access different um, uh, institutions and programs inside the university, but I think um, it would be great if the university or if the guild had like permanent resources that maybe they could collaborate with different societies um, to have permanent uh, resources on their website to actually raise awareness the whole year round. Because I think when we talk about things like um, as earlier we were talking about accessibility, um, it's a very top-down solution about like, because um, I think some people, like most students, like um, we don't really like, uh, we, we put all the responsibility on like uh, the administrations and whatnot. But I think um, if, if the whole student body was aware of things like how to make things more accessible or how to be more culturally sensitive, I think um, in that way, like we, we just naturally find societies and different student groups being more uh, inclusive and being more aware and more conscious about uh, the decisions they make. So I think, yeah, I be I want to work with um, all the awareness months that we have, but also like to expand them further to uh, be year round. I guess. Thank you. Um, I definitely agree that you know a lot of these communities that get highlighted um, for a month, they are ones that should be at the forefront of university year round. Um, we shouldn't be limiting, you know, diversity to being celebrated and talked about for just a month for these different communities. Thank you. So most societies have a welfare lead, welfare officer, or whatever, who cover issues of well-being, perhaps even accessibility. How can the Guild better support these individuals? Maybe do better training, resources? Does anybody want to talk about that? Oh, I, I talked a, a little before. So. As a psychology student, I know the the word the the best therapist of the world is the uh, CBT, the cognitive behavior therapist. So if I ask and invite those psychology students to to come to hold some some salons or some uh, psychology 
games to support students' mental health. And also we saw uh, the people around me, they are suffer the deadline and also the exam. And when they pet the animals and they will release their pressure. So I think we can bring some uh, cats, little or puppies here and to uh, let the students feed them and uh, pet them and maybe it will make them feel reduce their pressures and burden. <coughs> yes. Thank you. So I know um, just from my experience in the postgraduate society, we don't currently have a welfare officer. And that was because the election process and handover of the society took place really um, late in term one, and there is a yearly turnover with the committee um, of that society. So I feel like, you know, postgraduates are one of these communities that have kind of just been, um, you know, not really thought about when it comes to welfare because. <laughs> Um, there aren't better resources in place to hold elections in a timely manner and ensure, and ensure that all of these, you know, positions get filled for the society committees. Um, so I know that's definitely something, and I know there are probably tons of other societies who are in the same boat. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes? Building off what you just said, I think that one of the things I've found at least it doesn't mature students is how marginalized you guys are just cast to the side. I remember uh, the last week we got an email from this guy, I think his name was David or something, and he was talking to us about a group that just students have where you can actually join and speak to them about your campaign. Well, I think if you pull that to at least the forefront of the guild, where you have things such as like seminars for these students to actually be together, sort of go through the motions, I guess, to like help them with things, that can help as well. Um, I think, yeah, for on the topic of postgraduate students, I think, um, and talking about well-being students, or, or well-being officers, and how to best support them, I think um, uh, there's, I think, um, I think we could encourage societies to uh, adopt um, a new position of like postgraduate officers, like or um, if they have this a certain amount of postgraduates in their society, because um, I think it's a lot to put on one one person to uh, cater to the well-being of everybody, because they because um, uh, I know like with uh, LGBTQ song they, they have different officers to that are from uh, different identities that that understand more um, about how to help people of their same identity. So I think um, yeah, just like. Um, having more diverse leadership, and that comes with uh, having more roles, um, but yeah. So in many of your statements, you've mentioned international students as a group that requires greater representation. How could you go about bridging the divide between international and home students? Um, I noticed the question that uh, the current officer, they are all white. And although they are managed, uh, they are nations, maybe noble, and I don't think they are diversity. So um, as an international student, uh, I have a, a different background and I have different viewpoint to uh, one thing maybe. A local student uh, and also different language. And maybe we can hold a language corner to exchange. As in my country, they will uh, give the international student to local student to uh, into, to make integrations and uh, and let them to know have better understanding of the local culture, and they both can um, you know um, break uh, break the communication. The, um, reduce the bias of uh, cultural difference. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? I think honestly that's one of the most important things, right? That <laughs> Exeter has like an incredibly large international student population and they get pushed to the side once they come here because they're sort of just like viewed as cash cows. Like once they've got your body that's really all they care about. But I think the guild itself can start to do more and one of the things I'd also say on top of that is just so hosting like honestly like these sort of well-being events just to like tap in and like 
see how you're doing occasionally, just to make sure that you're not drowning under the pressure of a new city and a new country and a new language and a new culture. I guess um, a question that springs to mind that, like, that I'm asking is like, why doesn't the guild have more language support, um, like, uh, content in different languages? Because I think. Um, we we like we just assume if someone's an international student and they're coming over here that they um, they they can integrate like use the word integration like integrate themselves in the community right away. But I think um, yeah, there's just lots of things we can do to make it more practical. But I think also um, like uh, the, on the side of international students, I think um, there are a lot of things that make it harder to be uh, an international student, like um, with like. You know, this year the universities um, rolled out having to log your attendance manually um, to keep up with uh, the home office's uh, new immigration policies and whatnot. But I think, um, yeah, there, there, there's not much, like, uh, you don't hear about it much, and there's not a lot of uh, um, people talking about it. And with the guild officers, like you said, like, they can only understand um, from an abstract uh, point of view, they have to ask what is it like to be an international student. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, just having, again, more diverse leadership, but also um, just how to make things easier for international students to participate. That's great, thank you. Adi? Um, I agree that there definitely does need to be more support and representation for international students. Um, I think there is a um, unfortunate occurrence of, you know, getting accepted and then that's kind of it. it. Everything, you know, you get accepted and then it's like, all right, you're on your own, here you go. Um, so I think there definitely needs to be more support and guidance for how to, you know, complete the visa applications and, you know, moving over here and then support once you arrive um, because it is quite a difficult move and um, Recently, I feel like the UK government has made it very clear that they are not very friendly towards international students by some of the policies that they're implementing. Um, so it's, I think the university needs a clear stance that they want to support and welcome international students. Thank you for that. So many individuals from marginalized backgrounds often also face financial inequalities. Are the current forms of support offered by the Guild and the university adequate? And if not, what more could be done? Um, so this is something that is very important to me because I have um, faced very, um, I've faced financial barriers my whole life and it's something that impacts so much other areas of your life like your mental health, it can impact your ability to do well in school, um, you know, so these are things that really need more support. Um, like for instance, the two pound meal deal is great, but what are we doing to help support students for other meals throughout the day or on weekends? Um, what about you know things like toiletries, um, you know, sanitary, you know, um, hygiene products? Things are you know these things are essential, and there needs to be more support because um, you know. Quite frankly, the cost of living uh, crisis is uh, pretty bad. <laughs> Jane? Uh, this thing is really essential. As my friend and my roommate facing this, struggling with those problem. And I think, uh, as Annie said, the, the two male deal is a really good idea. And I think school could be uh, could give the students more uh, a scholarship and also they have more part-time job they can not only give students more working experience and also they will support for their finance so I think that's a good idea. Thomas? Yeah, um, I think with like necessities and uh, you know lots of students and lots like have to work in order to be able to afford their studies um, and, you know, um, with international students also, they're limited in the amount of hours they're allowed to work, but they're also not allowed to receive any um, financial aid from uh, either the UK government or um, like a lot of the programs that the university offers. There's just um, a lot that doesn't quite make sense with um, uh, 
the university <coughs> finances, for instance, like um, with uh, modules, right? You have required reading material that's essential for your learning. But why? Why is it often that you have to go out and buy um, these texts? What is your tuition paying for, if not for a full and complete access to your education? So I think, um, you know, uh, the, the ideal would um, is there, but I think there's lots we can do to bridge the gap and to make things uh, uh, easier financially uh, for students. I was always thinking, like you just hit the nail on the head with the whole idea about how two pound meal deals work and they're good, they're good at all, but what about the other essentials like you know, toiletries, just stuff that isn't nutrition based? I think that is one thing that Guild can and should do more about. And we just not much to say about. Thank you for that. Are there any questions in the audience that anybody would like to ask? If you do have a question, please just raise your hand so that I can choose it. Yes. Uh, a lot of the stuff you've talked about this evening is mainly done by the university accessibility to classrooms, um, main funding, visa, uh, visa application, for example. How are you, as a student officer of the guild, not a member of the university, going to use the guild's influence and you know to try and affect the university change you all seem so passionate about? So I'm just going to quickly jump in to repeat that question for all of you and then also for the recording. So basically a lot of the discussions we've been having have been focused a lot of the time on what the university does. So it's about how would you as a guild officer enact that change as a student? Does anybody particularly want to go first? Lead. Well, I think you you know that as a student officer, you're the liaison, liaison basically between the students and the university. and. Whilst yeah, these things are like all mostly university stuff, you can lobby on behalf of the students to try and enact change. Thomas? Yeah, I think um, as you mentioned, the the um, the university having programs to help things like student visa. But I think there's quite a big difference between having a program and having a program that's easily accessible or talked about or easily able. Um, to be applied for and accepted for, um, so I think that's a big difference. But I think, um, yeah, like, like you said, like um, as a, like as a representative of the student body, you have a lot of say over making things happen. I mean, uh, reading like the student guilds included in official university reports, like their financial reports, which you know um, they have a you know multi multi million surplus. So there's. Uh, if you read their financial reports, so there's there's a lot that they can do to make things better. Like, um, you know, hiring more people is in the tens of thousands <coughs> versus their millions of surplus. So, yeah. thank you, Jay. Um, you mean the student girl already do a lot of things, and what we could do, right? Um, and uh, I I think as actually there are a lot of my friends they told me that there are uh, really current things is that. Um, the, com the in the groups, the country people only talk to their country's people. I think it's a, uh, if you are in the group discussions and uh, the only if you are the only the foreigner in the groups, they will ignore you. So I think I need to have uh, some meeting of the international students and local students, and we can hold some games and hold some language corner to help them integrate with each other and know their culture better and reduce the culture difference and know each other cultures better. Thank you. So I definitely agree um, with what was previously said about power of lobbying um, in being the liaison between you know the students and the university. Um, I think it's really important in this role or a role like this to advocate for, you know, what you see, um, you know, what the students want. And I think all we can really do is really try and push, you know, and say this is what we've seen and heard amongst students and this is what needs to be done in order to fix it. Um, Thank you. So before we go to conclusions, I do just have one last question, if you could be quite snappy with this one. That would be great, thank you. So representing the student voice is a key part of this role. Outside of existing methods of listening to students in surveys, focus groups, are there any other ways that the Guild could reach out to students, especially those in marginalised communities? 
Uh, I think the main thing is societies, right? Because um, I think um, it's it's hard to organize people. It's hard to get to find people that are passionate about things. But if you just go to the societies that are made around um, these uh, issues or um, these marginalized communities, then you find a lot of people that um, they're part of these societies because they want uh, the extra experience for uh, their members to be better. And I think, um, yeah, I think. Um, like the guild shouldn't just be like sort of an organization that just kind of approves societies and just lets them out, right? We're we're all part of the same organization and we're all students and we all can um, collaborate to make things better. Thank you. Okay. Um, I I found that they are not a uh, complaining candle. Uh, that's the, although the, they they send an email to ask us to do the question uh, questionnaire, uh, but some students they um, don't like to do that. I think we should build a complaint candle, and which is in security uh, is security, and uh, um, they can complain on this channel and. Uh, mm, and also, if they face inequalities and uh, um, discriminations, uh, we can uh, go to this candle and uh, find. And also, they can have some suggestions give to us, and we build together to build a better tomorrow. Thank you. So I don't think it is enough to ask you know, people to come to the guild and talk about their experiences. The guild needs to be going to them, um, in integrating themselves within these communities, within these societies, and building a presence there so that you can really get to know what is going on. Because community knowledge is essential um, in role, roles like this, and people are the experts of their own experiences. And another thing I want to add is just that some people don't have societies because there's there's such a tiny margin margin, right? So I think the auto, the auto, there's an autism support group for autistic students to just talk about their experiences and check in with each other. And this ADHD group that's also started up has it. I think the guilt should should as Annie said, go into them and just sort of uh, I wouldn't say sit on the support groups, but sort of just talk to them after the support group session is finished and just get their own intake on what they're going through, I guess. Thank you. So thank you for that great discussion. Now, 30 seconds each, just to summarise you, your campaign, and why people should vote for you. So, Annie, if you'd like to go first. Uh, sure. Um, I really want to bring a focus on the students in this role, um, because in the end, it's really based on what the students need, and that's what I want to advocate for. Uh, I have three aims. The first is embarrass the diversity, no matter the sexual minority, uh, merit, uh, LGBTQAI+, and also the multi-faced people, and also the different color and gender they are. Uh, we embarrass the difference. And also I will support the student mental health. Uh, the last but not least, I will build a, a campaign a channel to make our um, community much better. Equality for our community. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying that I think uh, with anyone you vote for, you're getting a, a good choice. Um, I think uh, I just want to say that uh, a vote for me is a vote for someone that's that will be your tireless advocate that will fight for real solutions and um, and that yeah that just won't stop and uh, and will listen to your concerns and take them seriously um, uh, no matter like how small you think they are so thank you and lastly like Thomas just said regardless of who wins you're getting someone that's actually clearly going to advocate for you and at least for me I think we've just we've just got a duty to make things better those that come after us, so they don't have to go through the same negative or bad experiences that we did. And I guess a vote for me would sort of just help that, I guess. Thank you so much all for coming, and please do give it up for all of the candidates in this position.
break. So five minutes, feel free to get up, move around, and we'll move on to society's employability. <coughs> <laughs> Candidates Roundtable brought to you by Express FM and XTV. My name is Tom, I'm one of your heads of news with Flow at Expression FM. A huge thanks to Flow for hosting our first discussion of the evening on the role of communities and equality officer. Now though, it's time to meet the candidates for societies and employability officer and I'm very grateful to be joined today by Henry, India, Matthias, uh, Priel and Victoria. We do also have uh, Senen as a uh, other candidate this race who isn't unfortunately not here tonight. But before we get into the questions though, I do just want to ask our candidates to start with a 30 second introduction speech, just a little bit about themselves. And I'll start with you Henry, if that's alright. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Henry, I'm a third year PPE student, uh, I'm currently on committee for the Law Society and the Debate Society, and uh, well, we might all be saying this this evening, but hopefully uh, I'm running for Society's Employability Officer this year. Um, hello, I'm Priyal and I'm in the university studying business analytics and this is my final year and I'm currently the vice president of Indian Society, I'm also an Enactus Exeter and in the Guild Advisory Board members. Uh, hi, my name is Victoria Lopez, I'm Spanish originally but I live in Birmingham now and now in Exeter. Um, and I'm both social sector for the Law Society um, with Henry and um, Angelsoft as well and running of course for Societies and Employability. Hi everyone, I'm Matthias, I'm half French, half Italian, from Paris. I am president of the Italian Society, president of the Olympic Games Society, uh, publicity officer of Polish Society, education officer of French, and I think I forgot the name, yeah, general secretary of Eurovision Society, and I'm running as well for Society of Employment Officer. Uh, hello, I'm India, I'm um, a uh, final year film and television student, I'm president for Sex Expression and Uni Boob Team, and I'm the treasurer of the 93% Club, but I also am the career zones, one of the career zone interns this year, and I'm also running for Society and Employability Officer. Thanks so much everyone, it's great to hear how you are so involved with society, and so we'll get on to that <coughs> a little bit later. But to start off with though, I do want to at least draw on something that all of you have talked about in your candidate statement, and this is, as I say, the importance of society to you at university. Now, a, a point to start with though is generally how well do you see that the Guild has supported societies and also committee members as well? And we'll start with you, India, if that's okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think um, obviously the Guild um, has got loads of systems in place which are useful, but I think there's definitely loads more that the Guild can be doing especially sort of not just supporting students in September. I think that we need more support all year round. Um, I think it'd be really useful if we had more uh, accessibility to training and more accessibility, help with accessibility within the Guild. <coughs> Excellent, and we'll go on to Matthias. Uh, yes, so the Guild is being supported uh, to, uh, towards the committee or even members. In general, societies, uh, however, as India said, it, it should be probably more during the whole year. Um, there are probably a lot of things that, as uh, you know, president of the society, I've noticed, which is, I guess, changing a lot of related to the bureaucracy. Instead of filling up a lot of paperwork, like uh, I've had the experience, I would say, unfortunately, uh, to do, uh, probably do a lot of more practical uh, experience, more more practical things to know how to really do the stuff that could potentially work better. But outside of that, I think it's also very important to highlight that the Guild is also an organization with people behind. We can, as committee members, we can criticize them a lot, but in the same time, we also have to think about how much they sometimes lack of uh, people who work there sometimes, from what I understood. And it's important to have discussion. I'm all about diplomacy, trying to find the best solutions between everyone. And Victoria? Um, we're all very involved with society, so I think we all know that there is just some little things that need to change within societies and the guild. But overall, guild um, is very helpful and is very successful in the way that it manages societies. There's just a little few things that need to need refining, and hopefully that we'll talk about later on. 
Andrea? Um, yeah, I agree about the changes needed. I just wanted to say that I noticed when I came here as the Vice President of Indian Society, so for the Freshers Week, we weren't supported that much, and as a new society, it should be supported by the Guild, so I just feel the need to support more of the cultural societies or maybe the dance societies more, rather than just going on with you know, the business societies or the other societies like that. And yeah, like India said, like providing the support throughout the term and not just on the Freshers Week, but I also know that the freshers is the time where the students and the guild is very much involved in being busy. So I also want them to, you know, not just replying with emails and stuff, but also having some contact numbers who the students can just call and, you know, ask their doubts if they have anything. Another thing I noticed, sorry, was um, the financial stuff because when we um, ask for the reimbursement to student societies, it takes like one or two months to get back. So I think we just need to work on that as well. And Henry, yeah, I think I think I think support the uh, support right is is a very broad concept. I mean, fundamentally, the biggest issue I think with the guild and how they treat societies at the moment is they're quite reactionary. You know, you can. Uh, guild training, if I uh, don't know how many committee members are going to be watching this or in, in the audience, guild training is optional and it's on uh, the society dashboard and you have to go through about four different stages to get to it and it gets to the knowledge base which is a huge list of all the documents we have. Uh, multiple, uh, produced to change the website for example, multiple of those documents are out of date. Um, training is optional. I have introduced multiple committee members who I know personally to the fact that this knowledge base exists. They didn't know it existed, they didn't know how to access it. Obviously, we've had the uh, removal of Freshers Week, sorry, Welcome Week, I think is the official name at the moment. Um, there's been some massive beef about that. But, you know, you can. when I was a first year, you could pay physically in cash or, well, no, with a card, but uh, physically at a checkout at the end of your, your Freshers Week to join a society. You now can't. You have to go online and access um, the, the website. Well, first of all, the QR codes to access the website the Guild wanted to provide weren't given out until at the end of the day on the designated days of Freshers Week. So there's systematic issues with how they approach supporting committee members that I think need to be addressed. Okay, and perhaps on a more, as I mentioned by a couple of candidates so far, but I do want to bring it in, it's perhaps a more controversial action by the Guild, and this is this year relating to its move from a set freshers fair over to a more space out of welcome week. Now the Guild at the time explained to students that in previous years there had been feedback that a single large scale event had been too much and too overwhelming for some students, but several <laughs> committee members at the time did also criticise it. Now, in retrospect, because we are now in, you know, in January, looking back, do we sort of think that this was a good move from the Guild and how did the Guild respond to feedback as well? And are there not for anyone who wants to start contributing? I think, uh, I think Welcome Week uh, this year was welcomed uh, much better uh, than expected because I saw the criticism that lots of community members were making last June, I think last June, May, and I did agree to a lot of them. I even personally signed a letter, but I think looking at back to it and how it was made, there is pros and cons on both of them. Whether it's the Freshers' Fair uh, happening, that used to happen every Friday or the Welcome Week uh, now, because before uh, during the Freshers' Fair, it was a big, one big day for all the more than 300 societies that we have on campus that were literally all around the forum. And I spoke personally to a lot of committee members from you know, smaller societies that felt very isolated. Uh, during the Freshers' Fair, so it's for them having this welcome week uh, on spread out on different different days was very uh, was very beneficial because they they were able to you know sh just showcase what they wanted to showcase on that day. Uh, but the only f but then the only criticism I would probably get to if I could just ask you just to wrap up quickly. If that's okay, sure. and the only criticism I would get for welcome week is about uh, maybe publicizing better each day for every theme. Uh, but yeah, I completely agree with what Mateus was saying, especially as somebody who sort of like runs smaller societies. I think having the themed days was a really good way of targeting sh students who might be interested in. So for obviously with sex oppression, we were part of the um, like welfare we uh, day, which sort of meant that people who were interested in that, that sort of thing were able to come to us directly. Uh, but I do think that publicity is an issue, especially with the welcome back that we just had. It was um, quite poorly advertised and was sort of like shoved into one little room that not many people ended up going to. 
Um, just to add on, I completely agree. Um, but I think with any change, there's always going to be some negative um, perception and reception. And I think the main one was the change of Welcome Week, and if that was even necessary, because everyone still refers to it as Freshers Week. Um, so those little changes, stuff like that, I don't think that added much, but the fact that it created a narrow focus where people who are interested in well-being could then go to something specific instead of navigating this big campus was a big improvement, and I think that's something that we should take forward to next year as well, having dedicated days for dedicated areas, um, and I'm just going to pass on to someone else. Yes? Um, yeah, I agree as well. Um, I just think that this system was a bit more organized and it gave um, an opportunity for all the students to just go around and have a look and uh, talk to all the societies. Personally for me, when I was in my first year and being an international student, it was really difficult for me to go around, talk to the societies, people and navigate through. So I just think that for next year we need to show the students where each stall is because for me, my Indian society stall, we weren't given anything until the day of the event and we didn't know where the freshers should come and have a talk. So just that and I just think that it was a great way for the freshers to meet another friends and you know from their nation as well and even from the UK and just talk to everyone. I'm going to be honest I completely disagree with most of you know I don't think it was positive at all um, and uh, I don't, I'm not trying to be contrarian but how it used to actually work uh, for the first two years I was at this university is that you could book a stall in the forum as a society if you filled in a form early enough you could then have that stall for two maybe three hours and then a different society would take over it was practically exactly the same on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and then my first year there was an event on Friday and Saturday due to Covid to reduce numbers uh, and in my second year there was an event just on I think Friday now why couldn't we keep that system? Because effectively, we benefit from multiple different societies being in the forum and able, people able to discover that, but everything was there at the same time. I and mean, we're talking about small societies. If you were not specifically interested in a well-being society, but you walked past their stall, or a member of their committee managed to grab you on your way to rugby, for example, you could be drawn into that society and want to join it, but you can't do that if they're travel. not at the same fair. Sorry. Well, okay, to wrap up, I think it was uh, very silly, um, and it actually reduced the ability for people to advertise, reduced the total number of people we actually got to sign up to societies, which reduced funding, and actually made engaging with uh, new members really difficult. Would I be able to quickly add on to that? Um, I quite I disagree with that a little bit. I think the like opening up of it for extra days allowed for more accessibility, and as a disabled student, I found it very overwhelming to have the one day. I think having it spread over the three days sort of really helps accessibility needs. Um, and sort of like, again, like if you're not like, it's just really, it's really helpful for me personally to have it spread over the week. Um, I, I disagree with the society registrations because being on the Guild Advisory Committee, we've seen because of the surveys that due to this year's Welcome Week transition, the registrations in the societies are increasing. So I personally think that was good. Um, I just wanted to add that for Angel Sox specifically or any society that is trying to get registered by the Guild, it was very difficult to have a stall at Freshers Week even though there was a massive amount of interest. And that's something that needs to change in the future when there is clear interest that a new society should be set up, there should be a space at Freshers Week so that they have that exposure and they have people that are walking past and finding out about new societies, whether that be Angel Stop or whichever society will show up in the future. Completely agree uh, with what has been said about giving more, uh, how do you say, you know, timing, uh, showcasing, especially publicity uh, for all these new societies because I've noticed during that new Welcome Week that for example, I, I was paying a lot of attention to the cultural societies that were in the sanctuary, I think, yeah, on the, on the Wednesday of the Welcome Week, and there was clearly no publicity, nothing going on for people to know that they were there. So, consequence, nobody went, nobody knew where they were, and it was the same a bit with the societies that were in the terrace. So, weirdly, on that day, uh, the cultural societies were in the sanctuary, but there was nothing on at the forum, nothing going on at the forum. So, I'm just questioning a bit how we should you know, be organized. Um, yeah, well, on, on accessibility, I totally understand that like just one big event can be really, really stressful and not very accessible. But I do think there's 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 a medium position to be struck. So we could have two days, and I do believe that sometimes they've tried out quiet hours at certain times of the day, which are restricted for people with accessibility needs who need a quieter, simpler space. 
uh, or time going around. And I think I completely agree with actually what Matthias is saying on advertising here. Because principally, I don't know about everyone, but not everyone moves in on Friday, Saturday and Sunday uh, during Freshers' Week. Lots of people move in over Freshers' Week. So having the main event at the end of Freshers' Week was very, you know, sort of definitive. Everyone would go. If you have a slow burn across the whole week, A, if your site is on Monday, half the people might not have moved in so they won't come and see you. And B, you have a much harder time keeping engagement up across the week. Okay, thank you all for your responses on that. And I want to stay on society, so at least move on to perhaps another issue with societies. Because last year, Expose, the student newspaper here at the University of Exeter, reported that membership rates in societies had fallen by 18% that year compared to the year beforehand. Now, information this year hasn't been released yet, but based on that, what do we think has potentially caused a drop in society membership numbers when the number of students registered at the university has increased? And Victoria, I'll come to you first on that one. Um... It's very interesting, it's a fact and statistic that I did not know, but simply going off assumptions, I think it might be going back to publicity, maybe the rebranding was a little bit confusing and it meant that there wasn't as much exposure for all of these societies. Um, I know that sports is also a very big thing at universities, so the fact that maybe people were joining, they had to choose between joining a sports club or a society because of the cost of living crisis, it meant that they couldn't like register to as many memberships. And I know that Henry said earlier about you could do on the day, you could sign up to membership straight away, whereas now you have to go through the QR code system and online system. It's those little added complications that might have meant that there was less um, membership subscriptions. Um, yeah, I also think the same. Um, firstly, for the freshers of the Welcome Week, I've noticed that all of the freshers or even the postgrads who came to the UK, they didn't have an open bank account to pay from, so they couldn't register at the start and maybe at the end they weren't publicised about the society, for example, Indian society, I came to know about them after we thought about a collab with the Indian society, and even the adventure society, we didn't know that they, that existed. So I just think that lack of publicity and having more options to just like pay and going from the guild website. Plus, it's just that the information is just on the guild website and has now started going on Instagram and TikTok. So yeah, we just need to work on that. Henry, yeah, so I think that there's two things going on. Um, I mean, definitely the transaction cost of joining a society. Now you have to go through each individual page uh, to join a society. I mean, I think there's now four different societies which have law in the name, so it's quite difficult to find necessarily the specific one you want. Whereas before, in my first year, because um, I actually think it went quite well in my first year, there was a piece of paper, everyone would give you a barcode, at the end they'd scan all the barcodes, so you'd do <coughs> one contactless transaction on a, on, a, on, a, on a payment system, and bam, you remember all those societies. I don't understand why we can't do that anymore. But second, Unfortunately, I do think the decrease in membership might not just be down to that. I think there was maybe a bubble after COVID with lots of people really desperate to re-engage in the world and everything that's going on. So that could be explaining some of it. But I definitely think it being more difficult to join is definitely a problem. And of course, the cost of living crisis, as mentioned in the previous talk, probably has been a huge barrier because as the costs go up, societies increase their membership um, fees, but the student loan hasn't. It hasn't gone up, so it is more difficult and more expensive to get involved in the same number of societies. India, over to you. Yeah, I completely agree with the fact that the cost of living crisis is definitely impacting students. I think that with society memberships all going up, um, but also like the students being unaware of sort of like bursaries that can help them. Like we have the societies bursary where students can get fifty pounds towards societies if they have like a financial barrier to them. But I think also like with the amount of societies, it's getting quite hard to choose which ones to join. If you're on a set budget and can only join, say, three societies, then you have to choose between which ones you want to join. Matthias? I want to come back on one thing that Henry said about uh, two years ago, actually three years ago, when we had the QR code uh, for the start after the Freshers Fair. The good thing about this year is that the QR code was blocking us a bit about thinking, oh, Okay, I'm talking to the people on the community at the table, they're trying to convince me uh, to go to a society, but the good thing is I don't have to choose now. And the beauty of any society is that you can join them whenever you want uh, during the year, so from September even to the, to the end of the year. And then uh, to talk about the membership uh, that got decreased, I think, and I'm not surprised as well, I didn't know this exact, exact number, but I'm not surprised as well because I realised how much is, it is in the society I'm involved in as well, and I think it's all related to, first of all, the cost of living crisis uh, for sure, because the membership it's not a lot, I would say, for example, compared to the sport clubs, but uh, I think people are getting so stressed about the whole environment going on, so I think as guild officers, it's really important that we're here to support the students as much as we can and give them 
the fact that a campus is here to you know just enjoy and it's not a full time job. Would it be okay to just respond to those two? So the first thing would, was the fifty pounds that you mentioned. I just want to say that I don't agree with it at all. I think that before it was allowed for societies to subsidise if they could to low income families and people who came from a low-income family. Now that that's no longer the case, because if it's not offered to everyone, then it's counted as discrimination. And I don't think £50 is enough, and I think if a society is in a position where they can subsidise events like memberships, or um, any Christmas, winter balls, etc., they should be allowed to do that. Um, and then the second one um, was just uh, what Matthias, Matthias, sorry, was just saying, um, I just wanted to say that I completely agree with everything. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't want to take up time. I'll just jump off that, be real quick. Uh, yeah, so uh, on the £50 thing, it's amazing that that's a, an option that's available, but I've spoken to students who have tried to apply for it. You have to be a registered hardship student, which often means you have to give the university all of your bank account history proving you're in a difficult position and they can query large expenditure when they're doing that so in order to get that you have to be a registered hardship student now also 50 pounds may seem like a lot of money but uh, at law society for example we heavily subsidize our hall but because we have 900 members we have to subsidize it for everyone who wants to come so a, a ticket might only cost 45 pounds even if we're spending 90 pounds on the event for every person who comes but it costs you 15 pounds to join the society we're already over our 50 pound budget there we're already at 60 pounds so it's it, it, it's not enough <laughs> okay and I want to move on now to at least last question now to do the society element and this is to do uh, at least looking at there's often and occasionally in societies there will be welfare issues both within committees but also more broadly for members in, in this particular society arising from a society event now something i perhaps want to ask about this is do you is there generally enough guild support and guild training on this or is it something that perhaps needs to be looked at differently by the university on this and stuff i'll go to priya and start with um, yeah, I think there is enough support about uh, the welfare, but I think they have increased publicizing it like recently, like from last term. But I still feel that there isn't any support for the diverse student groups or maybe the international students. Because if I go and talk to someone from my own country, that would be more, you know, I would be more comfortable doing that and sharing my feelings or how I feel mainly for the freshers who come from back home and even if you um, look at the guild committees right now they're all white people as the previous communities and um, equalities officers said so i just feel about that and you know just making sure that um the person you're talking to you're comfortable talking to them and yeah just basically. yeah i think i think <laughs> as committee members we're all committee members we really care about our members' experience, them as people, like they're our friends, like nearly every, all of the time they're our friends. Um, managing welfare concerns and issues is such a problem because the guild is so limited in what it will allow any committee members to do, which I'm not saying is necessarily a bad thing, but if a committee, for example, asks someone not to come to an event because they've misbehaved or they've acted in a way that's made lots of other people feel uncomfortable, they can't do that, and you can actually be given a written warning as a committee member for doing that. You have to go through a formal process with the guild where you formally give them your evidence, and hearsay evidence is not sufficient. It has to be direct, um, like you have seen something or have something written down that you can show them. So the barriers here to accessing proper mediation support, um, the ability to actually solve big welfare issues when they come up, is just not there. And India. Yeah, um, I think that there's definitely more that, definitely more that we can be doing for welfare of committee, but also welfare of members. Um, I think there needs to be more sort of like official training that we can give. Again, not just in September, throughout the year. I think we're more focused on welfare, but also having things like consent training um, and more sort of like things available within the like guilds, um, like bureaucratic systems. Completely agree uh, with India because I think uh, it's getting a bit useless. I think uh, after being three years as president in, in the committee, I just think it's pretty useless to just fill up uh, a risk assessment like I just did this afternoon for a ball that we're organising soon. I was telling myself, what's the point of filling up my, this risk assessment and, for example, writing, oh yeah, we're going to have one uh, sober committee member for, I don't know, 50 people or something like that. What gives me the proof, personally, also to the guild that we actually anyone is going to respect it. So I think it's way useful to have proper training, uh, proper training to know what exactly the people are supposed to do, 
I know I've been to a lot of society events that I've even, I'm not part of the co committee. Last year there was a big problem in one of them where someone was very drunk and I think the person who was delegated to you know, solve this problem wasn't probably adapted and didn't have enough training for it. So this is definitely something we need to have a look at more practical stuff rather than just filling up uh, paperwork. Thank you. And Victoria? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that training is not compulsory. Um, Henry mentioned it earlier. It's confusing going on the system. Yeah, the options are there, but they're not necessarily accessible and they should be compulsory. Um, with my own personal experience of a that come to us and say, well, this happened to me, this happened to me. And I can't exactly go to the guild and like share that. Um, and if I do, they will just say, well, why don't you talk to the bouncers of the club and get them to sort it out? So I think that even though there is training, first of all, it should be compulsory. And when you actually do deal with them directly about the problems of the safety of women or other health um, and well-being issues, they're not addressed properly. And it's sort of just directed to someone else. And if that continues, then nothing gets sorted. OK, thank you all so much for your responses so far, of course. We've a lot about societies, but I do want to move on to the employability side of your role. Now, I guess perhaps start to face this is generally, how well do you think students engage with employability services at the moment? And off that, how well do the Guild support in signposting students to this? And I'll start with you, Henry, if that's OK. So employability is a bit of a, of a grey area, I think, to be honest, at, at, at this at this university. I mean, you might well have had a mandatory session timetabled in that you go to. It's usually online. There'll be an hour. They'll talk maybe about some broad, like, you know, how to research more options. I had one of these sessions. Uh, after having one of these sessions, I looked and a load of opportunities had already closed for the year. They had all recruited, and this was mid-October, and they'd all recruited by the, they'd all closed their applications by the end of September, for example. We have the handshake system, which is really useful and does do lots of events, but the handshake system doesn't feature any event a society does, for example. <coughs> so on Law Society, we've run loads of great events with like graduate managers um, for like law firms, and we're really interested in like getting as many people to those as possible. But they often have to happen separately to the career system and the handshake system, which isn't well advertised. People don't understand how it works. And you, even if you have like a dream job, if the event comes on, they usually pick up really quickly, and it's then really difficult to get on them through the through the university. So there are some issues, but there are the university does have quite a few systems, and there's also there's support going on from um, societies. I think it's just. <laughs> It's mainly, again, I think it's come up so much through our discussion this evening, communication and accessibility. India? Yeah, so um, uh, like I work in the career zone. If you see me there, I'm on the front desk booking all your appointments. Um, I think we've definitely seen such a big increase this year in people actively engaging with us at the career zone. Um, but I, again, I do think that like more advertising is needing of all the events that we're running. And like the, we said about our um, employability schemes, we do have loads that run throughout the year, not just in September, they just come up later on in the year. Um, but I think we do need to be bridging like the Guild and the Career Zone together to advertise more events and more sort of like, um, uh, uh, yeah, more events. <laughs> I agree with India and it's a good thing that uh, you know, people are engaging more and more in the, um, in the career zone, but I think it's also very important to highlight about how our committee positions uh, also help us a lot uh, to get skills and get, uh, you know, understanding of a possible thing that we could do, because by being an education officer, for example, a French society, I understood a lot of stuff about public speaking in front of people, giving lessons, and it's all kind of positions that uh, we, you know, we, we enjoy doing, I think it's all about you know, enjoying your time and not thinking it's very difficult. So by creating more opportunities, uh, whether it's for a paid job or even not paid uh, uh, with societies, you will learn a lot and yeah, that's really important. Victoria. I believe I speak for most people when I say that it's not until your final year of university that you kind of start to realise, oh my god, what am I going to do after university, the real world type of thing, and that's when you start to look into options. And yes, the handshake system is really good, but I think something that works even better and that uh, I think the guild should implement is networking events like the Law Society ones, where they might offer food or free drinks on arrival and even if people are not interested in perhaps becoming a solicitor or a barrister or whatever, you still go for the freebies and then you end up finding information about them. So if the uh, Guild could do something similar where they're constantly and regularly hosting networking events, not only for law but obviously all areas of employment, I think it's a really successful 
um, option that would get employability out there and get more students involved in finding jobs straight after university. Yeah. Um, I would like to say that when I came to the university, first of all, I didn't know what handshake was. So maybe like we should tell everybody what handshake is and how to navigate your way through that. Because I still, um, whenever I book my appointments with the career zone, I cannot find any appointments to like two, three weeks of it, and we need to sort that out. Uh, second thing is like the guild does not help the students internationally to follow the UK pattern, because I come from India and we do not have the same cover letter or the CV pattern, and while I was applying for my placements, I did struggle writing cover letters for my jobs and I didn't get enough help that was needed. So I think that is one area of improvement where the guild and the students can work more. Um, regarding the networking events, I do feel that there is indeed for more course related events because I'm doing business analytics and I haven't had any events like or any companies come through for that particular section. I have a lot, lot of people coming in or maybe the financial <coughs> economical people coming in. Yeah, Thank you all for that. And I guess just to stay on the point of employability is looking at last year the university uh, spent approximately 1% of its income from tuition fees on employment support activities, mainly being a career zone. Now, I guess, do we think that there is enough push at the moment to use these resources? And, you know, perhaps off the top, kind of the last question, do we think there are issues in the Guild perhaps some posting people towards employability resources? And for that one, I can't believe I will start with, I think it was you into it, was it next go first, Emily? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah I think that um, obviously, uh, as we've been talking about quite a lot, more advertising is needed of the Career Zones events. But I think that um, previous officers have definitely done a lot to help improve <laughs> this, with sort of like um, Izzy Dyer, who was the, what was then the activities officer, um, sort of like ran a um, charity net like um, networking careers fair, which was really useful. I think we need to do more um, events in collaboration with the um, guild and the career zone just to sort of like use both um, audiences to like make all of our events more inclusive for everybody. Yeah, I agree with India. I don't think it's about more about the budget or you know how much we get, we how much money we give to the careers. Like it's really about the advertisement for people to know about it. Because I don't know specifically what's the number of people who know uh, what the career zone is, but it's really low. I, every time I talk about it to people, they're like, oh yeah, I know what it is, but you know they don't really go to it because it's not much advertised. So it's yeah <laughs> really important to have a good connection between the guild the career zone, the uni, the students, and potentially alumni, because uh, they have a good understanding understanding, sorry, of uh, what it's been to be a student at the University of Exeter, so I think they're probably one of the best people to, uh, to help you to get a postgraduate job. Um, I really liked the point on alumni, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, and just to point out the issues currently with employability, I think we do get a lot of emails um, about employability and the options that are out there, but I would say this is quite a passive way to spread information. Um, I know lots of students who will not even like click onto the email. There needs to be more active ways of um, getting that information out there. Even when I have tried to access the information or access help in, in terms of my application for a job, there will be long waiting times and secondly, when, when you actually do get help, they can't say, oh, well, we're not allowed to do this. And so I think there's a lot of reform that is needed um, when you're trying to find a job, that it's not just looking at your CV, but also your cover letter or any jobs and actually being more productive and proactive in the way that we get those messages across. Yeah, so I agree with all the advertising thing, but I also think that um, personally, me being the vice president, I was I worked with Career Zone to help a session for all the Indian students get their CVs or cover letters ready or maybe like getting job helps. But I I know that Career Zone doesn't do it with other societies, but I think like Gil needs to work uh, allow Career Zone to work with the societies and you know work with other like law societies or even the cultural societies any of those do you know just spread the word around uh, i think there's a bit of an issue um with sort of you know specialization you know the career zone serve everyone they've got some great staff but they serve everyone whether you want to be uh you know a scientist a lawyer you know a politician whatever um and obviously staff and lecturers are very very busy 
Um, they don't necessarily have time to be giving everyone careers advice, and, our, and most of the staff in certain disciplines are academics, so they're not necessarily you know, professionals on the ground in companies who might want to go work for. If you want to do a PhD, they're great, but other than that, it's quite difficult. So I think, I think a lot of what is, needs to happen is, is integration. I think the career zone people need to be communicating with staff about their experience if they're working in industries, for example. So if they're lawyers, if they're uh, economists who work with banks, for example, then them working with societies to bring in those alumni who have just had that placement. They've just done that application system. You ask a 40-year-old how to do a situational judgment online test, they will have no clue what you're talking about. Thank you. Now, you had enough from me. I'd like to open up the floor very quickly to any audience questions at all, if anyone had anyone to ask. And just about that in the pilot show. Thanks. So, one of the biggest news stories and issues that's been about society over the last few years has been controversial societies on campus that have been formed. In previous years, it was Students for Life. This year, it's been Friends of Palestine. Previously, it was Zionist Society. Are you prepared to make those difficult decisions if you were elected? of deciding who is and isn't platformed and also where the line is in terms of protecting students if they feel they're at risk. So just to clarify, that was a question relating to in, in your role, where is the line for you in what societies should or shouldn't be allowed to register and operate on and around campus? I'll open up to anyone, so can I just say that uh, in response to you, no more than 30 seconds please, thank you. No, I'm just going to go very quickly, because you mentioned uh, a lot of cultural uh, societies. I think it's very, very important to make the difference between a political society and a cultural society, because I strongly believe that even though, for example, the Russian society, they represent a country that is doing atrocity uh, right now in Ukraine, they're still a culture, they still deserve to be together and be represented as a country, uh, as a culture, even though they don't, you know, they don't agree, obviously, with what their president is doing. So. They don't need to be friends with Ukrainian society, for example, but at least they, they should be allowed uh, to have a, a society. So it would be the same for a society that wants to be represented um, by Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Victoria? Um, even though there will be people who will form these very controversial societies, and a lot of people will disagree, the whole point of society is that people get together and have some shared interests. And so even though I might not agree with uh, a society that is against abortion, um, the fact that they can still set this up, um, they should be allowed, but ultimately it should be very controlled and very regulated in what they're saying and that they're not spreading any false information, but just the same way that the Tory party can exist and the Labour party can exist, it may be controversial, but that everyone needs a representation. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, um, so I do agree with Matthias and um, her as well, but then I just think that as a student officer we can just say what we feel but we can't force our opinions onto someone else and we can't say to them that you can't do this or you can't do that. So obviously you are a society, you have the right to you know, be with your own group, but if I don't agree with someone else, there's no need. For example, we're just uh, holding the cultural fest right now in March, so we can't really tell the Israel or the Palestinian society to not um, be a part of us, because yeah, even they are a society and they have their rights. I think, I think, unfortunately, a lot of what you want from your answer is constrained by how the officer would have to operate within the role. You know, they, they're a trustee, but they're not operational. They cannot dictate policy. Uh, they may well sit on a, on a panel if there's any problems that do arise, and then they, you know, they're asked to consult and make a decision in part of an appeals panel. I think, fundamentally, though, we're straying into, you know, free speech territory, but also, you know, almost our, you know, Classical liberalism. Think what you think. Have your own opinions. That's fine. We, you know, we have free speech. You can you can have your discourse. But when you infringe on someone else's ability to do that, that's when the problems arise. Thanks, Henry. And India. Oh, I think <laughs> I'll just keep it short and sweet. That it's really important to do this on a case by case basis, and um, just to make sure that everything is looked at objectively, and so that everybody can um, sort of like um, yeah. I'll just yeah keep it short. Thank you all so much for your time. Before we end, though, I just want to give you the opportunity to just give to the room and to anyone watching a very short 30 second speech, at least a statement at least, just outlining the qualities that you have. And for anyone who's still undecided why you have to say the qualities and the experience to make you a breakthrough role. And Inja, I will start with you. Um, yeah, I think my experience makes me very um, sort of like good for the role. Um, and I want to champion inclusivity and accessibility within the role next year. 
I'm not a politician, I'm just a student like all of you who want to make your experience the best possible. I have a lot of experience in societies by being in committees and creating two large scale events, which is the Football World Cup and the Exhibition Song Contest. My only goal will, I have no promises to make, my only goal will be to make your experience the best possible. Victoria. I think we're all very experienced having been on committee, so I won't say that my experience is the only thing that makes me suitable for the role. It's more about my personality. I believe I'm very proactive. Um, and I just want to give a new kind of life and personality to what is societies and go with my slogan, which is work hard, play hard. So, yeah. Priya. Um, yeah, so we talk about experiences and all this stuff. And I would also like to say that it's a work for me because, you know, I love working for the Guild and I really want to make your three or four, how many ever years you stay in the university, the best you ever experience and just get out of the comfort zone and experience everything the Guild and the university has to offer you. And Henry. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been very interested in what we can discuss this evening, but um, we've all done interviews, I think, for other organisations, so please do look for more information, find out more of what we think. My priorities are making sure the Guild is as democratic as possible, that they're transparent in how they make decisions and communicate more effectively with what they do, uh, and also that we like cut the red tape for committee members and fix the problems, and hopefully the experience I have as Treasurer of Law Sock and Vice President of Debate Society, two huge sites on campus, will help me do that. Well, thank you all so much for giving up your time out of your busy cam campaigns, I can imagine, to speak to us here today. Now, of course, we're going to get a short break now, but do stay with us, though, because shortly we're going to be going to Joseph Terry, head of a sports as expression FM, to look at the sports president election. But again, thank you all so much, and I'd love a big round of applause before I have. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your 2024 Guild Election Roundtable, part one of two. Of course, part two is tomorrow. You've had two great roundtables there, hosted by my good friends, Heads of News, Tom Langley and Flo New. But now it's time for the most fun, and I think what well, I the most important election, that's sports president for the AU. Maybe I'm being biased there. My name is Joseph Terry. I am the co-head of sports here at Expression FM, student radio station. We cover student sport here, Yesterday I was covering the Rugby League game against Nottingham Trent, we've covered EURFC, we've covered futsal, we're going to cover cricket this term, so I'm all about student sport and I'm all about representing the AU. So I will let our candidates introduce themselves, but just, to, just so our viewers here best to be online, just so you can essentially match a name to a face. So I'm just going to give a brief description of, of who these people are and then just give them a wave maybe to the camera just so people know who the face is. So we have Alice Mundy part of the coaching staff and a player at the Women's Cricket Club at HPP level. We have Chloe Whitworth to my right here, who's club captain of the Women's Football Club and also an EDI officer at the AU Executive Committee. We have Harrison Dibble to my closest right here, AU Vice President and captain of the Basketball First Team. And closest to my left, we have Rosa Sheik, who's President and First Team Captain of the Badminton Club as well as an events coordinator at the AU Council. There is one other candidate for this election who is not here today, that is Kushwa Brinton Haracha, and he is a Sports Management Masters student. So those are your five candidates for the role of Sports President. Without further ado, starting with Raza, 30 seconds, introduce yourself and what you do. Yeah, so I'm Raza, I'm the President of Badminton Club, first team men's captain and as you said previously, I am on the AU Council and the Medical Coordinator. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rosa. Thanks, Rosa. Um, Alice. Hi, so I'm Alice. I'm um, in my final year, obviously, of studies. I'm doing sports and exercise science. <laughs> I'm in the HPP cricket setup, and yeah, that's me. Great stuff. Harrison. Hi, I'm, I'm Harrison. I am a third year sports science student. Uh, I've been a member of the Bamsa Club in my first year at Raza, and I'm now a first team captain for basketball, and I'm currently G's Vice President. And last but nowhere near least. Hi everyone, I'm Chloe, I'm club captain of women's football and also EDI officer on AU Exec. I've been part of women's football since my first year and also have played football and futsal my whole uni career. Thank you everybody for giving up your time today. Let's go straight into our questions. We've got jam, jam packed agenda. So, firstly, you're there, you're on your laptop, you've made your application, you've made your resume. What is the biggest thing that convinces you to click submit on the application and run to be sports president? Harrison, let's start off. 
Um, so I've always been a, uh, an athlete, um, kind of the, the competitive nature of the job kind of uh, is very appealing. So because Exeter is quite a competitive uni for sport, I'd quite like to be part of that, that winning community and kind of contribute to that success. Great stuff. Chloe? I think my main reason for applying for sports press is that I think there needs to be positive change that needs to be made. I think extra sport is not accessible to everyone and the experience that I've had, my club and my family, and I want to make that the universal experience, regardless of someone's socioeconomic background, gender, if they have a disability. <laughs> Let's go to my left then, Rosa. Yeah, so I applied for it because since I've been at university, it has been such a massive part of my experiences, like all my experiences basically, and I like for it to be completely open to everyone. Um, yeah, it's just been such a positive part of the experience that I'd like for everyone to be able to experience that. And Alice? And Very similar to Rosa actually. So sport has been a major part of my university experiences, I'm sure it is for many people because sport here at Exeter is something that we all, most of us, are so passionate about and I want to get as many people involved as possible in any capacity. Nice easy question to start off there. Hopefully you've relaxed just a bit, just a bit you're relaxing and maybe not feeling like it's going to be a, an intense grilling like it was for the other two roles. I'm going to start off with another easier question, but I'm going to just slowly wade into the deep end, as it were, and I'm going to ask this. What have you learned about the AU over the two and a half weeks of digital campaigning that you've been doing, and also what do you think you will learn about the AU over the next week of campaigning you will do once in-person campaigning begins? Rutter, I'm going to start off with yourself. So, I spoke to a few clubs, and something that a few clubs have told me and something that I experienced myself was that sometimes the communication with the A between the AU and the clubs can be a little bit slow. Um, obviously that can affect clubs quite badly in terms of sort of getting things done on their own timelines. Um, something else that sorry, um, something else that I think could be slightly better was the representation of shoes of colour. Um, I think that that is something that can be pushed a little bit more because something that I found coming to university was that being on Bucks teams, I was probably the first representation I saw. So obviously that would be something that would be quite nice. Interesting comment you make there. Alice, uh, again, what have you learned about the AU over your campaign? So um, the AU, I, I've spoken to a couple of clubs as well when I've been <laughs> making my pitch, and a couple of people have come back to me, clubs say that the publicity at the AU needs to improve, and I completely agree with that. I think. You know, there's 52 clubs here and not all are publicised enough and I would like to see that improve really, so yeah. So, we've got two sides for one half, let's go to my right then. Harrison, what have you learned about the AU over um, the last two weeks? One thing I've learned is just the, the sheer amount of differing opinions um, from different AU clubs. So having conversations with a few of them, uh, they all have their own views on, on what the AU can be better um, and how they can excel themselves. Uh, so I think that's going to be a, a, a learning curve of the job, just trying to balance the, the needs of as many clubs as I can. Um, another thing I've learned is that the, the relationship with the Guild maybe could be better. Um, so obviously the, the priority is to get as many AU clubs participating in sport as possible, but I think that needs to be, to be stretched to those, to those Guild um, societies to also get them involved at the same level. Interesting comment there about the links between AU and the Guild. And Chloe, so what have you learned about the AU? Um, I've learned that there's a lot of willingness in the AU to pursue kind of initiatives like that include marginalised groups or underrepresented groups, especially in sport. I know that there's been outreach for international students, mature students, postgrads, and I think that's uh, building on what Harrison said about <coughs> Guild societies. It's kind of bridging that gap between them and getting people involved in activity and being healthy. Interesting stuff and uh, good answers so far. I'm glad to see that you're relaxing into it slightly. Let's, let's go into the hard political questions then. Let's go into the real issues that I think I see in the AU sometimes. You've all talked about inclusion and increasing inclusion on your candidate statements and I think for many people they think inclusion is a bit of a buzzword let's say. If you just say inclusion everyone thinks oh well that sounds good but let's just say this in one sentence, or two or three, in 40 seconds, whatever. I'll start with you, Harrison. What does inclusion actually mean? Can you define inclusion to me? And can you make it more than just a word that everyone here has said in their candidate statement? Um, inclusion for me, um, specifically for sport, means that everybody can have the access and feels comfortable 
in that access to be able to pursue whatever sports that they, they think they want to. Um, I think it's especially important for, for first years coming in that they feel they feel included in the sports community because it is such a great community um, and they, they just feel there's there's no pressure or there's no kind of there's no problem with them wanting to join one of those AU clubs. Do you agree with that definition, Chloe? Yeah, I think that's definitely a good start. I think <laughs> when you talk about inclusion, for me personally, it's about making sure there's those outlets for uh, certain students. So we, we want everyone to feel welcome. But are we setting up initiatives such as disability sports? Are we catering to those? Are we setting up neurodivergent friendly sessions? Are we kind of including those sets of students that necessarily would find it difficult because there isn't anything for them? Are we trying to include them actively? So we've had people talk about disability. We've had people talk about trying to make them comfortable in sport. Raza, what does inclusion mean to you? I mean, I agree with what Chloe said. I think that inclusion is a lot about sort of like pushing for more things that are, you know, like marginalised groups and trying to encourage them more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think being an exercise, I think it's important to understand the demographic we have here, understand that, you know, the typical exeter student probably wouldn't be pushed away from doing anything. Like, you know, they come here and they know what they want and sort of coming here as someone who may not be typically what exeter is like, um, it is, you know, it might be slightly more daunting for them to join, especially for, you know, some students like international students and, you know, students of colour, of course, because, you know, Exeter is predominantly um, made of white people. Um, I think that it makes, you know, it is important to push for them to be included more. That, that is something that I try to do as Drummond's president, sort of like pushing for more, um, like, <laughs> groups that we may not approach us first. So for you, it's about including ethnicity stuff that aren't included. Alex, yourself, what does inclusion mean to you? So um, within sport, there's obviously so many different roles that I think, um, as well as playing, you've got you know coach of a major parts, you've got SNC coaches, nutritionists. You know, there's so many different parts that I think as a uni we don't necessarily touch on as much. So there's so many talented students that have those qualifications that aren't necessarily utilising them as not enough in, in the clubs. And I would like to see um, more people, more coaches, more students getting involved in different capacities <laughs> within each club, more so, basically. Thanks for all giving your definition of inclusion. I think it's an important thing to talk about in terms of actually what we define inclusion to be, because like everyone says it, and I think half people don't know what it means sometimes. Now, if we were waiting deep end, we're now going to dive head first into one of the biggest issues I think there are with the aid with the reputation it's got. So, one of the biggest reputation, reputational issues with the AU is this idea that there is a toxic culture. And this idea that there is almost a almost lawless nature in some AU clubs that can go into the local community and trash the place, go to pubs, go on pub pools, go on socials, trash the place, and then everything's ex university bunch of idiots that go around destroying Exeter. And I think that is what lots of people think about the AU. And this is something that happens more than you think. I even have it on very good grounds that this, the last term as it is now, a well-known high-performance club has to ban socials and the members of this club were given a strict order to not tell anybody outside the club that this club had banned socials. I will not say who that was because I can't prove it, but I have that on very good grounds. So my question is this, and it's a tricky answer, so if you want to take time to think about it, think about it. Do you think the AU deals with these complaints <coughs> well enough? And also, do you think the AU has a good reputation on campus? Harrison, as current vice president of the AU, what do you think? Uh, I think I think the reputation is, is definitely there for that kind of kind of um, disruptive nature. Um, I'd like to think that the AU do do everything they can to stop that as much as possible. So I know we definitely have our, our, our risk assessments and stuff that people have to fill out before socials and, and similar things. Um, and I know there's, there's been a couple instances this year where people have been told not to do certain things and, and they've still done that. Um, that would be definitely something we'd have to look at to, to try and kind of deter people from, from doing those activities. So whether that be more, more severe punishments or or more, more longer-lasting punishments to kind of stop them doing that. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, 
the reputation stepping in there is something we need to address. Raza, what's your take on this issue? I think in terms of sort of what the AU does currently to stop that sort of behaviour, I think they are doing sort of like what they can. Of course, you know, stuff like submitting, as Harrison said, submitting risk assessments and things like that, you know, the club can tell you what they're going to do and then go and do something else. So, of course, it, it's quite hard because it does eventually just boil down to what the people are going to do. And, you know, those people may just, they just may be doing what they want rather than acting, you know, as a student of Exeter, you know what I mean? Um, I think it is a very, it's a very tough issue to, to talk about, of course, because, you know, it puts a lot of responsibility in the AU to deal with things in a way that may not even be possible for them to deal with. You know, they may, ha you know, for people to stop doing certain things, like, you know, things that would be against the AU code of conduct, um, they may have to stop people from going out completely because, you know, there's really no way of wardening when people are doing things that are wrong when it's not on t on uni time or on uni campus. So I think that's definitely something that needs to be looked at. Thank you. And Alice? Yeah, so, so they've mentioned the risk assessment form, so our social sec last year, so obviously you've got to fill out one of those before each social. I think there's, you know, rules in place, obviously, so you've got to have it done before, like the Friday before the Wednesday, <coughs> you've got the social, so that allows enough time to, I think, for people to question if there's going to be a risk there. But I agree with the fact that I think that you often just hear from the AU when you're in trouble. And I would like to improve the transparency and like improve conversation between committee members and the AU as a more informal like conversation just so that you're aware where you stand with them more frequently, basically. Thank you. And Chloe? Yeah, just to kind of build upon what everyone said, the AU do have that protocol, they do have those steps, we do have mandatory committee training at the start of every academic year for the new committees, um, and what they go and do in those socials is, is a difficult thing to deal with, but I do think there needs to be this kind of zero tolerance policy, and also it's about being transparent, as Alice said, like, are we going about it the right way, are we be, being completely transparent with all clubs? Thank you for all of this question. I know it's a very difficult question to answer, but I think it's an answer that we need to ask if we are going to be talking to the people who may be elected as leaders of the AU. Question five now, out of eight that I've listed here, it's going to focus on parasport. Exeter does not provide much parasport. They only provide adapted snow sports, and recently <coughs> they've been providing pick-up and play sessions for the visually impaired and for deaf people in football. And if you look in Bucks para sport, there's plenty of other sports where they offer. They offer swimming and universities like Nottingham, Edinburgh, Warwick all participate. Wheelchair basketball, Loughborough, Durham, Cardiff Met, powerlifting, Birmingham, Loughborough and Bath. So, extras behind on this, have you thought about what you want to do in terms of para sport? Is that something that you would maybe want to try and push for at least, if you were elected AU president? And what's your thought that actually extras so far behind other rivals in the student sports space. Alice? Um, it's definitely something I would look into in terms of seeing um, what, how many people would be keen for that. And um, in terms of the... Oh, sorry. Take time, take time, take time. In terms of that, I can't personally speak from much experience, but I think that is something that does need to be looked into and to, we can go from where, how much buy will we get from that? Harrison, your thoughts? Um, I think the, the main thing with uh, increasing power sport is probably the awareness. Um, uh, if, if we can increase the awareness, we, we might be able to then increase participation. Um, definitely from a basketball perspective, we are trying to get a, a charity event with, there's a, there's a Devon wheelchair basketball team that we're trying to organise that with. Um, so if I was to get um, the president role, it's definitely something I'd try to put on a, on a uni-wide scale. Um, because obviously that's a that's a that's a cohort of people that we're not including in sport, um, and that's that's what we should be increasing is the participation. So getting as many people as we can. Chloe. Uh, yeah, this is something I'm really passionate about. I was recently a part of setting up the disability football that you mentioned before the pitch and play sessions, and getting that funding, kind of putting that program into action. It's been great to see the response. We've developed an amazing relationship with Exeter City Community Trust. They have numerous disability programs across a wide array of sports. And it would be great to get on board even further with them using their facilities like the power chairs, etc. 
Um, I've just got on my notes here, 24% uh, of students indicate that they have one or more disability or prefer not to say. So there is um, that field of students that needs to be represented. And last but not least, Russell. I think there's something that's pretty good. So you mentioned obviously other universities that um, already have sort of parasports um, like opportunities in place, and I think that's you something. Basically, parasports at, at, at Bucks Net. Yeah, of course. Um, and I think there's something great about these universities is that they're so heavily publicised. So like I've even seen you know Loughborough Parasports. I've seen some of my friends doing it who um, you know who may not play sports before, and then they have the opportunity to try something new. And I think. That's something great about the culture of these universities is that it is coming from right at the top where they are trying to push for sort of these sorts of things. So as Harrison said, trying to organise, you know, within basketball, trying to organise things um, like parasport opportunities. I know fencing are doing something similar. And so I think sort of having that push from the top, having, you know, having that communication being built in to the committees with these, you know, with these different organisations to try to build that. So I think right now the idea of you know bringing power sports is very much like a per society basis, and I think that makes it really overwhelming because obviously for Harrison, for example, trying to do power, like um, try to start um, basketball power yeah, sports, basketball, he yeah. needs to organise everything himself sure. with yeah. the society. But obviously, so, so, so it's a top down approach just for summarising your argument. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask one question. Then I'm going to go out to any audience questions if there are any. We've We've the hands of people trickle through who I think have got some thoughts about how sport is run, maybe. And it's going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a jargon question, this, but it's a question that people who do sport here will be aware of. And it's the issue of HPP, or High Performance Pathways. So High Performance Pathways, right now, the way it works is that if you are seen by a university as a sport that has the pathway to getting a professional contract, let's say rugby with Chiefs, or cricket with Western Storm, or Somerset Cricket, or Gloucestershire, or let's say even netball with the, with the Cardiff Dragons or Team Bath, you then get more money and you also then get better facilities including strength and conditioning, coaching and also performance analysis. So there are only a few clubs that have this HPP status who are the following. Cricket, golf, hockey, lacrosse, rugby union and netball. But there are many other clubs on campus that also have links to other professional or semi-pro clubs, namely <laughs> football, Tennis, Rugby League, with Cornwall Rugby League in the third tier, League One, and also American Football, who have one of the leading teams in the South for their for the college, for the, uh, well, for, for CFB as they call them, because it's Americanized, but university football, as it were. So, this is something you'd be aware of, and some of you here are part of HPP clubs, some of you aren't, for example. As somebody who may be running the AU, do you want to extend HPP status to more clubs, and how important is it for you that you maybe consider that? Harrison? Um, I, I think it's definitely something that, that should be considered. I think that the feasibility of adding more sports into the HPP programme is something that would need to be discussed. Um, I don't want to speculate and say that we could or we couldn't. I'm not asking um, to speculate either, but it's just a case of perfect scenario. Oh, it, it, yes, absolutely. In a perfect scenario, um, all the sporting teams would have the same access to do the same facility, so, so the strength <coughs> conditioning coaches and the equipment. Um, and as a, as a non-high performance athlete, is, it's something that's very frustrating seeing that the, these other sports are getting these, these preferential treatments. Um, so, so maybe if sports couldn't get these full high performance status, there could be something um, in the middle that we could offer, so whether it's, I don't know, uh, free gym memberships for those those non yeah. performance athletes. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that, that there's, there's def also definitely a divide between high performance and not, yeah. which would need to be addressed. Good. Chloe? Um, yeah, I completely agree with Harrison as a part of a non high performance sport as well. It's definitely a demand, especially in football. We kind of see the inequalities and it's a tough one to take, especially when you sit in the same leagues and perform as, as well as those other sports do. Um, so it's, if it is feasible, like in, a, in an ideal world, like Harrison said, everyone would be high performance, um, but it's kind of looking at those sports that, do they have players who play for Exeter City, Plymouth Argyle, international players, and can we facilitate that in some capacity? Um, recently, I managed to get our club kind of basic s &C sessions, but we had to set that up on our own and with little to no guidance from the Athletic Union. So I think maybe providing that more for non-HPP sports would be a better way to go. Alex, you see first-hand benefits of HPP, you, you are a coach <laughs> HPP level and also a player. Given that you've seen that first-hand, do you agree with that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's obviously, like you said, there's limited sports for HPP, but being in HPP, I've loved the environment that's created. I feel like it's, such, it's a very professional environment, and I do think it's something that could be created further, like, in other clubs. So, like I mentioned earlier, there's so many of our students that are coaching qualified and SNC qualified and nutritionists and so on, and I would like to expand and use our student network to use those, utilise those in other clubs, and I feel like you could create that professional environment that you have in HPP with other clubs by using our own students. And rest. There's actually two things I'd like to say about this. I think um, something that I realised about the AU is that everything is basically based on box points. So as badminton, in badminton we've got, we've not got many teams because you don't have much space. And so, you know, our women just won Southern Prem, but because we only have four teams, we're still sitting eighth in the league. So it makes it, you know, it makes it very difficult to justify sort of like bringing more teams into it. But I think something that I realised with the AU as well is that it's very much a all or nothing approach. It's very much like the entire sport gets HPP or absolutely no one gets it. And from personal experience within badminton, I can see how having sort of like a little bit of help, you know, as mentioned previously by, I can't remember who specifically, but you know, having maybe like gym sessions with people who may be, you know, at that level, you know, and I think, I think that was plugging you. Yeah, like um, yes. and I think sort of like having sort of like a middle ground where some students get the support where they can push their sport forward rather than just like having, you know, programs where new entire sports get added because, I mean, personally, I've been trying to get badminton on it and, you know, yeah. it's looking It's at, difficult, isn't it? Yeah, like it's difficult, very difficult. I know there's some people part of rugby league as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to now go to the audience. Any questions in the audience, please? I've got questions in hand just in case you don't have any, but if there are any, your time is now. Bated breath, bated breath. Yes, we have one. The one and only Tom Langley, go for it. Um, so this new one of the initiatives which the Student Guild has introduced is to do with pitch up and play, uh, which is the idea of you know, more casually getting people. Sport fields have intramural sports as well. But people who you know, perhaps just, you know, may not be the most active people but do struggle, perhaps have that you know, initial struggle perhaps getting into sports club, what do you perhaps see as the best step? Or what do you, how well do you think perhaps Perhaps A has been acting in going towards getting students who you know are to have an interest in sport, you know, or interest in intramural or pitch play, for example, in Guild, but just don't have that initial confidence to get involved in those sports in action. So to just repeat that, essentially, how can you try to promote people that are really passionate about sport, maybe passionate about casual sport and such so intramural, but just aren't quite confident enough to make the jump and join that club? Alice. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, um, I think student coaching is a great thing, and if you know, there's so many of our like friendly faces around offering those help, helping how to get into a sport. Um, that would be great, and it goes back to like advertising and publicising the fact that um, there is that option. Like, like you said, the pitch up and play. Like that's, that's been such a better thing. And it's really well advertised, and I think we could get a bigger buy-in um, just by advertising that more. And I think it's a great way to start and I think by using student coaches and friendly faces thank you. yeah thank you thank you thank you Russell. I mean I think I'd like to say that I think the pitch up and play scheme has worked really well especially for badminton um, we're getting a lot of new people join us and I think that if we keep working on that sort of thing and try to expand it as much as we can and try to you know try to bring it to people who may not know about it then I think it could help us a lot Harrison uh, yeah so so the, the IMS stuff which is kind of Lent to the people who aren't part of the AU clubs, it still has quite a competitive nature, um, whether it's kind of a, a netball match or, or a badminton league. Um, I think the, the way to get people who aren't massively confident involved is to set up more beginner coaching sessions and kind of basics to the sport sessions rather than stepping straight into those intramural competition based settings. And Chloe? Um, I think the pitch for play sessions have been very good this year. They definitely come across at least from the social media promotion that I've seen is that they are that friendly environment, they are that friendly saying it is for anyone of any ability. Um, I think how to get people more involved in that would be going out and talking to them, going to the interview building, talking Thank to you. those people. Yeah. Good stuff. Right, uh, running out of time rapidly now. Uh, 25 seconds, 30 seconds, why are you the best candidate? Alice. Um, I want to get as many people involved <laughs> in sport in varying capacities, whether that's coaching, playing and I just want your voices to be heard and
for as many of us to play sports as possible. Thank you. Chloe? Um, I really want to make extra sport accessible to everyone, regardless of um, their background, um, and I feel like I can do that very well with my experience and my ethos. Harrison? I think my role as Vice President and a member of the Sports Park staff already it gives me a good behind the scenes and a good knowledge of the job already. And I'd like to find a balance between sport and excellence um, and participation extra. And I think that's where the, the best, uh, the sporting environment will be, be the best. And, and finishing off, Raza. Uh, I think that my proactive approach to, to engaging with people and to solving problems um, using the limited amount of resources available will make me a great candidate for this position. Great stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much. Round of applause for candidate. Gentlemen, that is it for night like one of 2024 Guild election roundtables. Got some thanks to give. First, thanks to all the candidates. Some are still in here, uh, some have sadly uh, gone. But there is thank you to all of everybody who's given up the time. Thanks to our partners at XTV for providing all the amazing gear to film and also to document this moment. And also many thanks to, to the teams at Expression FM News and Expression FM Sport as well. And Express FM has been conducting interviews with all the candidates. Those will be going live on all respective podcast platforms. Search for Expression FM News, that's X P R E S S I O N. And also, you will be able to re watch this on XTV online YouTube in the next few days. So you can relive all of this over again. The best thing is, my friends, this is happening all over again tomorrow evening. Doors open again at 6.45, 7 to 9 p.m. where your candidates for student living, education officer, and of course the big one, Guild President, will be discussed tomorrow. And of course, just a reminder, voting opens on the 29th of January and closes on the 1st of February. That's all the important stuff for you to hear. Thank you to all the audience here. Thank you to everybody that's taken their time to be candidates. And thank you for your bravery for speaking in front of an audience as well. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Good evening, good morning, good night, whenever you're watching this. See you soon.